Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash and this is episode 89 in the series. Welcome, it's lovely to see you guys. I'm happy to be spending another Sunday in the yarn slash classroom. And for those of you who are coming back, you know I'm a professor at the university here in Urbana, Illinois and the yarn room has become my Zoom room with my students. So it's like science, science fiction or knitting all the time in here. <laughs> Not a bad life really, if you think about it. So welcome back if you're coming back, it's nice to see you and thanks so much for all the comments and the coffees and just wonderful correspondence we've had, the messages, exchanges, coffees. Um, I really appreciate you guys and it's nice to have a community out there, especially during the pandemic. Uh, it's nice to connect with people. So, so yeah, thank you. If you're new, this is a podcast about, largely it's about knitting garments and garment design and garment modification. So that's what you'll usually find here. Some spinning thrown in and uh, lots of teaching and just whatever I feel like uh, doing in terms of garments usually. <laughs> so what do I have for the podcast today? I have a finished object. This is the Brighter Cardigan by LB Hand Knits and I'll talk about this FO. Uh, I have a couple sweaters on the needles that I'm, I'm just going to mention probably. Uh, I finished my design, mohair. I'm still in, I'm still looking for a name. You guys had some really great suggestions, but I'm still looking for a name for that one. So I might talk to you a little bit about that and specifically about the grading of that pattern that I'm, I'm starting to work on. Uh, I have a couple of acquisitions that might interest you from Norway. And uh, one of them involves a sweater for our dear dog, Tink. So that, that'll be a little bit a uh, tiny segment in the cast. Uh, otherwise, I just have a couple of notes up front. I want to thank all of you for sending coffees in. Uh, right now we're donating, I'm donating all of the coffees from uh, the Knitting the Stash podcast up through the end of November to Andrew and Andrea of Fruity Knitting. And as some of you know, uh, right now they're going through a hard time. Andrew has been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And so they're raising money through their Patreon page, uh, which they've always had for their wonderful podcasts. And if you haven't checked out their podcast, you absolutely should. It's wonderful. Uh, lots of interviews with industry folks and designers, and it's just really great content. Uh, so they have a Patreon page. They have direct PayPal um, donations that they're accepting. I'm donating coffees this month. And uh, if you guys are interested in picking up a shawl pattern and donating to the cause, uh, JP Knits One on Ravelry, she is Jackie, J-A-C-Q-U-I on Instagram, has put together the, this beautiful shawl called the Verit Verisol Shawl. And I think it's a $4 pattern and all of the proceeds, 100% of the proceeds are gonna go over to Andrew and Andrea of Fruity Knitting. So if you wanna get a pattern and Donate to a good cause. There you go. There's your <laughs> there's your way, and I'll put a link to that over in the show notes. Uh, so you can find me. Speaking of show notes, just about everywhere as knitting the stash on Instagram and Ravelry, obviously on YouTube and on the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com, and that's where I put all the show notes. So all the things I talk about will be over there with links, and you can check that out if you like to. I think I'll jump in with my finished object first. This is the second of the cardigans that I talked to you about way back last March, before the pandemic began. I mentioned that I had finished a couple of test knits and I couldn't talk to you yet because they, uh, the patterns weren't released. Well, Albina of LB Hand Knits has released this one. Um, this is brighter and it is a beautiful cardigan, um, top down, uh, seamless construction, yoked sweater. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the modifications I made to it and the yarn I used and all that kind of good stuff. So the yarn I used for this one is Naturally Nazareth. And for those of you who have been around with me for a while, you'll probably recognize this yarn. I've used it in a number of sweaters. And one of the reasons I like to use this yarn is that it's really economical. So uh, an entire skein of it, it's a worsted weight. So you're getting two hundred, a little over about 200 yards for 100 grams. So each skein is about, it's under $10 a skein. And they come in these lovely colors. I've, I've used their grays, um, their kind of oatmeals. I've used this beautiful blue, which I love. And the nice thing about going back to a yarn that you know is you know what it knits up like. <laughs> so um, for a lot of the sweaters that I've knit, because it's a worsted weight, you're using around the same needle size. And so I have lots of sweaters that I can just pull out and use as massive gauge swatches, which is really just kind of perfect. So for this one, I didn't even need to gauge swatch. 
yay. <laughs> and it ended up coming out just perfectly in terms of sizing. Uh, and like I said, this yarn is really fairly uh, inexpensive. So you can knit a sweater like this. I think I used maybe, I want to say six skeins of yarn for this, maybe even less. Um, so it's totally, um, you know, like a, it's a fairly cheap sweater. That's like a 50 or $60 sweater. You know, a lot of yarns are like $20 a skein, $30 a skein. This stuff, totally economical. I love it. Like I said, this is a top-down uh, seamless construction. And that's kind of what LB Hennett's um, Albina is one of the things, her trademarks is this kind of seamless yoked construction. And I think it produces a really beautiful sweater. Uh, this yoke in particular is just one of my favorites. And I think you can see it on the camera. It goes all the way around. It's this beautiful cable pattern. There it really is. Um, with some bobbles and uh, just some really simple cables. And it creates just this beautiful, I, it feels like a crown over your shoulder, like some kind of like royal, uh, I don't know, thing on the yoke. It just feels really cool, especially when you wear this one. And I, I really particularly like the way this sits on me. And I'll put some pictures in here of me wearing it um, so that you can see the actual fit on the shoulders and in the arms and through the body. Uh, I knit, uh, I believe this is the 30, it's either the 36 or the 38, so it has some ease for me. And a couple of cool things about this pattern, uh, it's written and charted, so don't be afraid of the cables. If you like written patterns or if you prefer charts, you can get both in the pattern. Um, and the sweater is also, uh, the pattern offers you a cropped version and this full length version. Albina is really good about um, offering you options for your knitting. So oftentimes your sweaters will include an A-line, a straight version, um, sometimes they have shaping to them. Uh, and then cropped versions, long versions, all kinds of different options to help you kind of pick something that might work best for your body. So it's one of the things I appreciate about her patterns. Um, this, because this is knit uh, in reverse stockinette, you can see this is like a pearl background onto which the cables kind of sit and kind of pop, which is really nice. And that's another good reason to use this Naturally Nazareth yarn is that um, it's a good, uh, three ply, three ply? Is it three? Yeah, it's three ply yarn. So when you work with this with cables, they really pop and it, they, have, they have a real textural um, kind of element in the final design, which is really nice. So you have this reverse stockinette kind of background for the cables, but since it's a yoked sweater, you can knit the sleeves in reverse, which is pretty awesome. So I actually knit the sleeves inside out so that I wasn't working pearls the whole time I was working knits. Uh, and I think that's a pretty nice Whenever I'm knitting a sweater that's a mostly reverse stockinette background, I love being able to knit it inside out. It's just, it just makes it a little faster and a little easier. So that is nice to do. Um, so modifications that I made to this sweater. Uh, I use German short rows as I always do for just about everything, um, including the short row shaping that happens. There's a couple places for short row shaping. Usually short row shaping will happen down toward the bottom to let this sweater kind of swoop around your butt. Uh, or up at the top to raise the neckline. Uh, and short row shaping can also be used, one of the other most familiar places would be for sleeve caps. Not in this case, but um, in other cases. In, for example, the sweater that I am designing right now uses short rows on the sleeve cap. It's one of my favorite techniques. I learned it from Isabel Kramer. Speaking of which, I'm wearing one of her alias sweaters, which I absolutely adore. Um, yeah, so short rows. I used German short rows rather than wraps and turns. Uh, and then I used a, an I-cord around the top. I did it on the wrong side of the work. The pattern calls for it to be on the right side of the work. But I just like the way that it showed up with the wrong side of the work application. So I went with that. And then the majorest modification that I did is that I added an actual button band to this sweater. And I did this after the fact. Spencer and I, Spencer's my husband. He's uh, also my button sewer. <laughs> so he always, he's the sewer in the family. He can sew just about anything. He can do hand sewing, machine sewing. I rely on him for all my buttons. So the sweater is intended originally to be, to not have this extra button band that I've put on. It's supposed to sit kind of flat. I think you can see that with this, because this is all integrated into the sweater. So as you're working back and forth in your rounds uh, with the cardigan, you're also adding these beautiful button bands to the front of the cardigan. So it's meant to sit like this and you're meant to have like toggle 
closures. So you you know put some sew some leather on here or faux leather or whatever it is that you want to add to kind of clasp to close these toggles over onto the side of the the sweater. So Spencer and I tried a bunch of different closures and none of them quite looked right to me. I just didn't like the look of it. It didn't, it kind of sat a little funny. It, it, it wanted to open a little bit because the leather was sitting um, way over here and it just wanted to kind of, it just didn't look right. So I opted to add this button band after the fact and I think you can see it there. So I basically picked up stitches along this edge and in a you know a certain proportion, like every two out of every three rows or three out of every four rows, uh, and then worked uh, what I've learned from Albina to be a one row buttonhole, which is a really easy way to do the buttonholes, and I think they come out quite nicely. I'll try to show you one up close here. The nice thing about these buttonholes is that they're reinforced, and you do it all in one in one row. You don't have to cast on any stitches. You don't have to do anything special. You just do this really cool technique with a yarn over and yeah I did a double yarn over in here to make a big enough button to fit these toggles through and it's a fairly I wanted to keep the button band about the same size as the original um, button band so that it wouldn't when I closed it it wouldn't hang over the side of the sweater and you know create any kind of disproportion in terms of you know how the front is looking so I think I achieved that and I really quite like the way that it closes now because it sits flat and flush and the it still has the effect of having the kind of toggle buttons to give it that look that I really like in Albina's original design. So yeah, and these buttons, by the way, if you're interested, these came from um, Sun Yarn Studio, Erica of Sun Yarn Studio. Uh, she has a shop on Etsy and they're actually from Lithuania. Uh, and I just really, I love them, and I think they're just beautiful, I don't know, they're just the right size, they're just the right texture, they're just beautiful handcrafted wood buttons. So, yeah, Lithuania. Awesome. So, that is Brighter by LB Handknits, and uh, Albina has offered you guys a coupon code if you're interested in picking up the pattern for yourself. It's just simply KTS40, and that will give you 40% off the pattern. Uh, and like I said, the pattern is written and charted. You can do the cropped version, the full length version, all that kind of stuff. I'll put the info over in the show notes. And if you're interested in knitting it up in the Naturally Nazareth, it, this is a Kramer yarn and it is available in a bunch of different places, uh, including from Kramer yarns themselves. And I found it, like I said, to be a really economical solution for a lot of really cool worsted weight sweaters. So I'm gonna swap out my model and we'll talk about the sweater design I've been in the middle of. And voila. So many of you uh, who are tuning back in will remember this sweater that's been in progress for quite some time. I'm calling it mohair because yes, I'm still waiting for a good name. I love the ones you've suggested, but they haven't quite, it's not quite right yet. I need to find it. Uh, so this is mohair so far. And uh, when last we met, I was waiting for an extra skein of the beautiful Green Mountain Spinnery Lana uh, yarn because I ran out. I should have had enough, but I didn't quite because I was holding the yarn double. Um, I ended up needing a little bit more yarn. So I was able to complete the sleeves, as you can see. And yeah, I know I was gonna do some cool different stuff, but I decided that the look of this sweater is actually just pretty classic the way it is. So that's what I went for. If you were gonna knit this once I write up the pattern and you wanted to modify it, as I'd encourage you to do, then uh, that's one thing you might be able to do uh, on your own when you're playing around with this uh, design or recipe for the sweater. So yeah, both cuffs are done, and luckily for me, the uh, die lot was not different enough that it actually mattered. Um, I can barely tell where the new yarn starts and the old yarn ends, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, it, this sweater ended up having a kind of sweatshirty feel, which was kind of what I was going for, so it, the armholes, uh, the upper arm circumference is a little bit looser than like a sweater like this, where it's very tailored and fit, fitted to the shoulder and to the arm. It has a little bit of a looser feel and it kind of comes down to a taper toward the, um, toward the wrists. The other thing I did was I added the collar and I went with about an inch of the one two by two ribbing and I picked up, you will remember last time that I had a really nice clean edge because I used the Coco Knits um, kind of integrated decreasing method 
where you basically decrease uh, over here away from the edge stitch so that everything is really nice and neat on the edge. So I could have left the edge just as it was, but I love the way that this uh, v-neck kind of closes out the whole sweater and just kind of brings everything together. So uh, I had that extra stitch. You might remember I had a little stitch marker hanging out down here. And that is so I could end up doing these center double decreases at the center of the v-neck to create that really nice look of the decreases kind of coming together into that central line. And uh, my rate of pickup was such that it, nothing got distorted. So that's a little bit tricky when you're doing a v-neck. You have to figure out what your rate of pickup is going to be. Um, and it'll all be in the pattern. <laughs> and then I had my back neck stitches on waist yarn, so I just picked them up. And as you can see here, one of the things I wanted to do with this sweater was to create a little bit of this darker color from the sleeves, both at the back and then over in the shoulders, so that it almost looks like a little bit of a saddle shoulder to kind of bring the whole thing together. Uh, so you can see the short rows I did in that color, which lifts the neck up just a little bit, and this sits really nicely on the back of your neck because of that. I think you can kind of see it on the model there. It's not too high and it's not too low, it just creates a really nice uh, kind of swoop uh, across the back neck, and that helps because then the v-neck sits just kind of perfectly it kind of fits and feels pretty good right about here. Uh, and I like the way that looks. Yeah. So those are the two things I did. <laughs> finished the neckline and finished the sleeve. And right now I'm working on writing up the pattern, which involves taking my crazy uh, legal pad of notes and turning them into something that's <laughs> legible for other people. So as I've been writing up this pattern, I've been thinking a lot about inclusivity of sizing, and that's something that the yarn community has been talking about really in earnest for the last year or two, but I know it's a lot longer of a conversation of inclusion, size inclusion for smaller sizes, for larger sizes, for different kinds of bodies, all of which should be recognized and not uh, made to feel like they're outside of some kind of you know, size range for a garment. Um, so in doing that, uh, I was thinking a lot about this particular design, and I wanted this design to be, I don't know how to put it, like classic enough and simple enough in its moves that uh, it would be modifiable and it would be gradable from a small size up to a larger size without too much fuss. Uh, and that's because this is going to be the second time I'm grading a pattern for, um, for a garment, and the first garment was full of cables, pretty complex in terms of grading, and I really only had the time and the mental power to grade from, I think I graded from a 32 to a 40 or something like that, which is a very modest sizing. Uh, and what I'd love to do eventually is go back and expand the sizing on that sweater. So when I was designing the sweater, I wanted it to be the kind of sweater that I would be able to grade myself uh, and practice grading on with a simpler construction so that I could get good at grading and then apply those skills back to other sweaters, um, other designs that I've come up with and other sweaters that I've knit so that my patterns would be more size inclusive. Uh, and one of the things I've been looking at are sizing charts, uh, which are, <laughs> depends on who you ask, sizing charts are a little problematic because um, they're based on standards and averages, so they're not based on real real actual bodies. They're based on these standard averages of bodies, which means that you kind of like take that middle point, which is means it doesn't fit anyone in particular, right? I've talked about size inclusivity and, and charts on here before, uh, and in the Better Sweater series, I think, if I'm remembering right. So uh, there are a bunch of different size charts on the market now. Um, some of the more kind of standard ones are from the Craft Yarn Council, for example. Um, and so they look like this. Uh, and you can find them online. This is from a book called Knitting Plus Mastering Fit Plus Size Style 15 Projects. This is by Lisa Schroyer. This one came out in 2011, and I don't like to think of it as plus size, and I don't think anybody likes to think of it as plus size anymore, just size inclusivity. Um, so please forgive the title of this book. The nice thing about this book is that it takes the information from the charts and it actually talks about the fact that when you're grading patterns, you're not just simply grading everything bigger. Like, you know, your neckline, uh, you know, this space on the back of the neck from you know, here to here, or even this opening is not going to be just that much bigger or that much smaller based on, uh, you know, going up or down a size or two or three. 
some of the measurements in a sweater, even if you're adding ease, are going to stay relatively the same whether you're making a size 36 or a size 56. So you got to know which places the ease actually changes. So like length of sweater might not change, it just depends on how large the bust is and how the sweater is hanging from the bust. So little things like that. And so I'm learning a lot of those tips and tricks from reading this book, um, which talks about bodies and how when, when you're sizing up a garment or sizing down a garment, you're thinking about those places in the body that stay relatively the same and those places in the body that will need a proportional amount of change in order to get the same effect of the final pattern and the final design. Uh, so that's been really interesting. The other thing I'm doing is uh, I've been taking a master class in grading that was created by um, Joelle Kelly, and I'm actually listening to the module um, from Julie Robinson right now, which is awesome because she talks about the history of grading and the history of sizing, which is a real <laughs> crapshoot as it turns out. And one of the reasons we have you know, all the differences in sizing and grading that we have has to do with the non-standardization of which, um, in which the history of the whole process began. So that, that's been absolutely fascinating. And that's your little mini history segment for the day. Uh, I don't want to steal her thunder by, by re-telling uh, her stories from this masterclass. But if you're interested, the masterclass, I believe, is still available. Um, and it's Joelle Kelly, and I'll put a link to it over in the show notes if you're interested in learning about grading for yourself. The class has, I believe, three or four different modules, and it takes you through some of the very specifics about how to set up an Excel spreadsheet, what are some of the principles of grading, all that kind of good stuff. So if you're interested, it's a great class. The other resources that I'd point you to are Yusolda Teague has an excellent um, Excel chart up that's uh, her own expansive sizing, and it goes every two inches, so from I think a 30-inch 30, 30 bust all the way up to a 60-inch bust in two inch increments. And she gives you all of the different body measurements that you would need to work on, uh, to work into your design for fit and for grading. And you can modify it. So, you know, if you don't like the size of the upper arm or the wrist or the neck, you know, opening, and you think that they should be a little bit different, you can get into her Excel spreadsheet and change them and then use those numbers for your own grading purposes, whether you're working in Excel or just doing it by hand. And Albina and I have talked a little bit about, we just, we both tend to grade by hand, <laughs> just sit there with a calculator and do the numbers rather than work in Excel. But I think Excel actually would give you um, a leg up because once you do the hard work once of inputting all of your kind of sizing information, body sizing measurement information, then you can use that to, you know, grade patterns a little bit faster as you go. So it's not that I'm against Excel, it's just that I've got to learn to love it, kind of like... I don't love working on a sewing machine, but I will sit there and hand sew for a while. <laughs> These are the quirks. These are my quirks. Um, the other resource, besides you sold a Teague's Excel um, body measurement chart, uh, is uh, Marnie McLean has an excellent tut tutorial about how to set up an Excel spreadsheet for um, sizing and grading. So I'll put all of that information over in the show notes if you're interested. Um, and I'll keep you uh, up to date on how I'm doing with the grading process and the kinds of things that I learn, hopefully in the next episode. So yeah, this is my mohair and it needs a name and that's, it's finished. I should be celebrating, it's finished. But right now it's just a mess of notes on a legal pad and I need to, I need to go back to it and, and give it the love that it deserves. <laughs> So the last segment today is on some Norwegian knitting, and I know we finished our Knits in Translation series last year, but I'm still obsessed with knitting in translation, so I can't help myself. Uh, and this book just came out. This is Linka Newman's new book. She has an older book, uh, her first book, which I also wanted to get a hold of, which is coming out in English pretty soon. I'm pretty excited about that. But this one just came out, and it's in Norwegian, and I could not help it. I just There's a sweater in here. It's the one on the cover. Uh, it's called the Hopi Sweater and it's just uh, gorgeous. I'm not gonna knit it in these colors, I'm knitting it in a different palette that um, showed up on Instagram, which I loved. Um, but in preparation for knitting up some of Lincoln Newman's designs, I checked out her Ravelry page and she had up uh, an incredible dog sweater. <laughs> I know this sounds kind of wacky, but it's called the Alasku, I'm not, no, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's A-L-A-S-U-Q. 
And it's a pattern for a dog sweater that's in both English and Norwegian. Uh -huh. So I've downloaded both versions, and I think following the pattern in English and then cross-checking in terms of terminology for decreases and increases and the color work and the, all that stuff, charting, I think I'll be able to translate, roughly, the Norwegian pattern that's in here for the sweater that I want. So that's my strategy. Knit a dog sweater in an English-Norwegian pattern and then use that knowledge to create <laughs> a sweater from a Norwegian-only pattern. This is my strategy. We'll see how it goes. So the dog sweater is a really uh, nifty colorwork sweater. Yes, colorwork and dogs do go together. And it's knit in this um, Alifloss Lopi, which is the Lopi yarn that's a little bit uh, uh, bigger than you know regular Let Lopi yarn. And this is the main color. It's this kind of pretty um, oatmeal-y, gray-y kind of color. And this is just the upper neck part of the sweater, which is ribbed. And this is going to be for little Tink. Tink is our dog who always gets cold in the winter. And after her crazy accident last year where she cut her back open, she's kind of enjoyed having the equivalent of like a thunder vest on. Um, and when she goes outside for our walks and stuff, it's nice for her to have a sweater. So this will be her sweater. and. I've looked at a lot of dog sweater patterns. I've had a lot of advice. Thank you very much for those of you on Ravelry who have sent me wonderful messages about dog sweaters. Uh, and I'm hoping that this one will be good. It's supposed to be kind of for active dogs who like to play around and do a lot of stuff. And if you look at uh, any of Lincoln Newman's patterns, she often has her, these great sled dogs in the, in the pattern. So she knows where it's at in terms of active dogs who need sweaters. So I think this will be a good design for Tink who likes to run around and just be kind of pretty wild all the time. The one modification I'm going to make is that in the back of the sweater I'm going to add a, uh, some, somehow I'm going to add an opening so that when we put it on her we can also put her harness on and which usually goes under the sweater and then her leash can kind of come out the back. So that'll be interesting. We'll see how that goes. Um, I need to figure out a way to reinforce it. Maybe it's a simple sewing method, but if you have any ideas about how to reinforce um, openings in knitted objects so that leashes and things can go through them but not fray the edges, I would love to hear your suggestions. Yeah. So I think, I think that's it for today. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. It's been lovely to talk to you guys. Uh, and I will keep you posted on the new pattern and the dog sweater and I'm knitting a sweater for my dad right now. There's just, there's a lot of sweater in going on as usual. But I hope you all have a safe and wonderful couple of weeks and I will see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.